Let us join together in prayer. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Sometimes casual readers of the Psalms view the 150 Psalms as discrete pearls on a string. But of course, as soon as you take a Psalms class from anyone in our excellent Old Testament department, you will learn that the Psalms are structured, ordered, coordinated. There are themes, topics, clusters. One of the clusters of Psalms uh, starts at, verse, uh, at, at chapter 37. This psalm underscores the importance of waiting on God. Then the application of this waiting on God theme is worked out in painful self-examination in Psalms 38 and 39. But now in Psalm 40, at least initially, the gloom is lifted. There is a triumphant outcome. I have waited on the Lord. David has waited on the Lord, and the Lord has helped him. That brings us to the first of the two principal divisions in the psalm. First, joyful praise to the God who helps, verses 1 to 10. This section can usefully be broken down into four parts. Number one, personal testimony, verses 1 to 3. Verse 1 bursts with delight. I waited patiently for the Lord. That's probably just too tame. I I waited perseveringly for the Lord. I waited and waited. I persevered in waiting for the Lord. And he turned to me and heard my cry. What was it that David was saved from? Well, metaphorically, a slimy pit, a miry bog. The picture is one of floundering helplessness, even horror. Think quicksand. And God saved me from it. It's not just that David escaped, like Jeremiah escaping from the pit in Jeremiah 38, but God pulled him out and planted his feet on a sure and safe place. Of course, sometimes in Scripture, when we cry to God in our despair, God does not remove us from the present horror. What he does instead is add grace. Ask Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Paul, who had been used of God to perform miracles for others, now when he's faced with what he calls a thorn in the flesh, this messenger from Satan, He prays diligently, three times, he says, which surely means more than muttering a couple of lines somewhere between pulling on his socks and sipping his orange juice before he beats it out the back door. He he, he set aside times for diligent intercession. And the Lord's answer was, not going to do it. I'll give you something else instead. I'll give you grace. So much so that Paul can actually glory in his weakness because the weakness provides the opportunity for the demonstration of God's power. I will therefore glory in my weakness, he writes. So whether in our crisis God removes us entirely, saves us entirely, or adds grace, it is still the act and goodness of God. What is remarkable about David's personal testimony here is that he does not focus all his attention on his own release as if he is at the center of the universe. There are some testimonies that sound like that, you know. God exists primarily to give me a wonderful testimony. No, his words give praise to God and flow outward to others. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in him. Then, second, public principle. Personal testimony, then public principle, verses 4 and 5. It is as if David wants to extract general public 
principles for the people of God from the matrix of his experience of God's goodness to him. In other words, the blessing is not just for himself. Rather, he moves from talking about himself to uttering a third-person blessing. Blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord. And the hook word trust shows that the two passages are linked. In his testimony, he says, many will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in him. And now more generically, indeed, blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord. Let such trust triumph. The one who trusts in the Lord experiences God's blessing, whether in grace or or, or in perseverance, uh, in, in transformation. But the one who trusts in the Lord is blessed by God. Such a person does not look to the proud, does not turn aside to false gods. Indeed, there is some reflection here on the wider goodness of God. Those of you who have been through really, really deep waters will surely know that when you are in a miry bog, your horizon becomes limited. When you're in your fourth session of chemo and you just can't stop vomiting, it's hard to have a great intercessory prayer life. You just can't look beyond the horizon of the immediate and the painful. When you go through great emotional pain, maybe your parents have been divorced. One of your children is critically ill. It's really hard to think in worldwide evangelistic categories. You just want to get through one more day. But then when you come out the other side, after the Lord has answered your prayer, you begin to get things back in perspective again, and you begin to see how good God is. Oh, You see it in some sense as you're going through it, but the horizon is constrained. It's, it's a vision that's restricted. You, you, you can't see much beyond the immediate. And then afterwards, you start counting your blessings. I'm a child of the king. Christ died for me. I have the Spirit as the down payment of the promised inheritance. Glory is yet to come. Death does not have the last word. It may be the last enemy, but it doesn't have the last word. One day I'll see Jesus. One day I'll see my deceased loved one. And God looks after every little detail of my life. It's unimaginable what he thinks of how he plans, how he understands everything, prepares the way before me. I'm sorry if there's any moment where I doubted him. The horizons expand again. You see, that's what's going on here. Many, Lord my God, are the wonders you have done, the things you planned for us. None can compare with you. Were I to speak and tell of your deeds, they would be too many to declare. It's not enough just to talk about release from the miry bog. That merely becomes a trigger for a much greater testimony. Do you see? The passage is reminiscent of another psalm. Psalm 139. Verse 13. You created me in my inmost... You created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. Then this. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, They would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I am still with you. If I understand the flow of the argument aright, this is less a testimony to God's omniscience than to his omniscience worked out in planning the psalmist's life. Read the verses together. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, God. 
That is, God has it all planned out. That's exactly the kind of testimony that is given here in Psalm 40. Many, my God, are the wonders you have done, the things you planned for us. None can compare with you. Were I to speak and tell of your deeds, they would be too many to declare. Here is public testimony. Third, personal self-dedication. So there's personal testimony, then public principle, now personal self-dedication. What's the only adequate response to a God like this? Slaughter another cow? Offer up a sheep? Or if your finances are restricted, settle for a turtle dove or two? Is that the adequate response to God? David doesn't think so. Sacrifice and offering you did not desire. But my ears you have opened. I know that's a difficult line. We'll come to it in a minute. Burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not require. Then I said, here I am, I have come. It is written about me in the scroll. I desire to do your will, my God. Your law is within my heart. The only adequate response to the sheer grace of God is the sacrifice of ourselves to God, the giving of ourselves to God. It's the only adequate response. This is not the abolition of the Old Testament sacrificial system. But the Old Testament writers themselves make it clear that sacrificing a cow can hide a darkened heart. We must come to grips with this line, 6b, but my ears you have opened. It's difficult. Most people say that the Hebrew should be understood something like, but my ears you have pierced. And they suggest this could allude to the ear-piercing ceremony in Exodus 21. In the ancient world, ideally, there was no slavery in Israel. It was more like indentured servitude, ideally. That is, when you couldn't pay your debts, you became an indentured servant for a period of time. But when the seventh year came, you were supposed to be released But suppose you borrow some money from some rich friend and then the economy goes belly up and you can't pay it back and you become his slave temporarily, his indentured servant. You come to the end of the seven years and lo and behold, it's 30% unemployment. Meanwhile, your master has given you a place to live and your your family is with you and, and you have plenty to eat and honorable work. Um, And you look at the economy, 30%. If you let this go, um, it might not be such a good deal. Um, I'm happy here. Why why should I go somewhere else? So there was a ceremony by which this person could become a permanent household slave. The person was taken to the door of the house, and his earlobe was pressed against it, and a sharp awl was taken, and the ear was pierced. A way of signaling... This slave now belongs to this household permanently. So some have said, maybe that's what's going on here. David is saying, I'm your slave, God. Full bore. I'm yours. And it's possible. It's possible. But people have noted, nevertheless, that in the ear-piercing ceremony, there's only one ear that's mentioned. But David here says, my ears you have pierced. So some have said, it doesn't seem like the obvious connection. Others have pointed out that the verb, some render as pierce, could be dug. My ears you have dug, or we would say dug out, same word. What might that mean? If you have no idea, you haven't met my mother. My, my mother was born in East London, and she had all kinds of cockney expression. She was literally born within the sound of bow bells, the, officially, the official designation characteristic of, of a cockney. And she had all the rhyming slang and, and all, all, uh, dozens of, of idioms that I, I don't hear from anybody else except those from East London at the beginning of the 20th century. Um, the, the beginning of the 20th century bit was when they were there, not when I was there. 
And, and so when we kids were not instantaneously obedient, she could say things like, oh, dig out your ears. And, and I, I just haven't heard that amongst others. Have any of you heard dig out your ears? Uh, uh, no, no, I'm here seeing a lot of no's. Uh, but I heard it often. Um, and, and it was uh, not a way of suggesting we get Q-tips, still less a spade, and start digging. It was a way of saying, listen up, listen up, open your ears. And of course, that metaphor is found elsewhere in Scripture, though with a different verb, not least in one of the great servant songs. In Isaiah 50, the servant says, The sovereign Lord has given me a well-instructed tongue to know the word that sustains the weary. He wakens me morning by morning, wakens my ear to listen like one being instructed. The sovereign Lord has opened my ears. I have not been rebellious. I have not turned away. I offered my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I did not hide my face from mocking and spitting. Which works out in the ultimate servant. In Jesus going to the cross not turning away from those who beat him and pull out his beard, not simply because he loves us, but because he obeys his Father and does his will. But there is an extra problem. You you, you see, the NIV handles this, my ears you have dug out, by saying, but my ears you have opened. That makes sense. That's, it's not a, direct translation, but it probably gets across the idea. My ears you have opened. You have made me to listen to your word and your way and your will. But of course, those of you who are interested in how the New Testament quotes the Old, you cannot, remember, you cannot help but remember that this passage is quoted in Hebrews chapter 10. But Hebrews chapter 10 quotes it from the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old. And there this same line is rendered, but a body you have prepared for me. Now stick that in your exegetical pipe and smoke it. (laughs) What are we going to do with that? The short answer is I don't know. But I have a much longer answer. (laughs) Sometimes we don't know because there's not quite enough evidence to be sure. But one can make some reasonably intelligent guesses because you watch how things work elsewhere. Sometimes when you translate things, you have to use another expression to get across the thought. I was brought up in French Canada. (coughs) J'ai le chat dans la gorge. I've got a cat in my throat. If you think it's strange for French Canadians to have cats in their throats, let me tell you, they think it's strange for you to have frogs in yours. So you come to a text in French that says he's got a cat in his throat. How are you going to translate it? Well, you might translate it, he's got a frog in the throat, because um, it's a different word, but it's a similar sort of idiom. But supposing there's some deep theological connotation associated with the word cat, (laughs) then you've got a problem. You either preserve... Cat, which makes the whole thing sound silly in English, but at least you have the theological connection. Or you have the word frog, which makes it idiomatic, but then you've lost the connection. And in either case, you'll probably stick in a footnote to try to explain it. Now, I'm guessing, but I think a Septuagintal translator, long lost in history, came to this passage and said, but my ears you have pierced? My ears you have dug up? That doesn't make any sense at all in Greek. I mean, I, I see what it means here. It means, it means that I so listen to God that I, I, I give myself to him. I, I, I listen up. I, I, I pay attention. I, I devote myself to him. Do, do, do you see? I'm, I, I'm his. It, it's as if I, I give myself, my whole body, my whole being to him. Hey, I, that's it, he says. But a body you have given me. A body you have prepared for me. And then it becomes roughly equivalent to what Paul writes in Romans 12. Paul there says that he presents his body as a living sacrifice, his spiritual worship to God. He he devotes himself to God. It's the only adequate response. 
But there's something more important yet about Hebrews chapter 10 where this passage is quoted. We read, The law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly, year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. Otherwise, would they not have stopped being offered? For the worshipers would have been cleansed once for all and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. But those sacrifices were an annual reminder of sins. It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, and now we're at our passage, sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings you were not pleased. Then I said, I, here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, my God. What we have here, of course, is an instance of what Christians call Davidic typology. That is to say, not only does God establish the Davidic dynasty in 2 Samuel chapter 7 and insist that there will always be a David eye to sit on this throne, not only does this get fleshed out and filled out Two or three centuries later, under the prophecy of Isaiah, who understands that the day is coming when these words will make sense. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Of the increase of his kingdom there will be no end. He will sit on the throne of his father David, and he will be called the Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. There is a growing expectation that builds and builds and builds until you're looking for the ultimate David. And that means the pictures of the first David are sort of projected down this line, bit by bit, in a trajectory. I I rather like the word trajectory rather than typology. This is a Davidic trajectory, all the way down to the ultimate Davidide. And so many of the things that happen to David are picked up and fulfilled in the ultimate David. So, for example, if Psalm 69 is devoted to David's suffering in many, many respects, three times lines are picked up from Psalm 69 and applied to Jesus on the cross. Betrayed by his own familiar friend. David walked this way before. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Psalm 22. But ultimately picked up by the ultimate David, who, like the first David, at the end of the psalm, does not relinquish his trust in God. So if David here gives his testimony and his personal devotion to God, so there is a sense in which this is a picture of the ultimate David eyed, who, like the servant in Isaiah, who has his ears open such that he always hears God. Indeed, in one sense, the perfection of David's response could never be managed by David himself. He was, like the rest of us, inconsistent, exhibiting the highest devotion in one moment and the most appalling sin the next. But in this Davidic trajectory, here is a David eyed with perfect obedience. His ears opened, his body devoted to God himself. In that sense, this is not merely saying burnt offerings and and sin offerings God doesn't require because they're inadequate to the task of personal devotions. It's saying you must see that on the long haul, animal blood doesn't wipe out sin. On the long haul, it's it's a temporary expedient pointing to the ultimate Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You must see that. Then I said, David writes, here I am, I have come. It is written about me in the scroll. Probably when David says words like that, he is thinking about things that have already been predicted about about, uh, God's anointed one. But when Christians read these lines, they cannot help but recall that there are a plethora of Davidic promises looking forward to the coming of the Lord's anointing. The scroll, who knows what it is? A coronation decree, perhaps? Psalm 2? But here, in any case, is personal devotion to God that finds its ultimate fulfillment in Christ Jesus himself, 
who came to do everything written about him in the scroll, who perfectly does God's will. And finally, in this first part, there is public proclamation, verses 9 and 10. I proclaim your saving acts in the great assembly. I do not seal my lips, Lord, as you know. I do not hide your righteousness in my heart. That could be misunderstood. There's a sense in which we're supposed to hide God's righteousness in our heart. But what he means is, I don't hide it away privately in my heart. Instead, rather, I speak of your faithfulness and your saving help. I do not conceal your love and your faithfulness from the great assembly. Now, how this is worked out in any culture is dependent on many, many, many factors. I was brought up in French Canada, so there is a Latin side to my temperament. But my parents were both born in the United Kingdom, so there is a pretty reserved and private side, too, which means I'm a deeply conflicted person, basically. <laughs> so there's a part of me, you, you know, that, that looks up to the person where he just lost his job, his wife has died, his house has burned down, and his dog was killed. And then is asked, how are things going, Robert? And the answer is, things have been better. And then three years later, he's happily remarried. He's got a better job. He's built a lovely house and has a new Labradoodle. And you ask, how are things going, Robert? Lots to be grateful for. And there's a part of you that wants to say, um, is there any life in there? Um, (laughs) At the other end, you find some people with more um, exuberant temperament, shall we say, and maybe from a denominational alliance that um, specializes in um, venting and uh, expressing itself. And, 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 And now you ask the dear brother or sister, Uh, How are you doing this week? Oh, I had a cold. I was at death's door. I prayed and God healed me. Hallelujah. And you want to say, buy a box of Kleenex. Do you know? (laughs) But somewhere between those cultural polarities, you want a people to offer ready public praise to God. David recognizes that it's his obligation to do so. I will not keep silent. I will not hide your righteousness in my heart. I will speak in the public assembly. There is a sense in which older Christians who have been through deep waters have a kind of obligation in the assembly, in the family, in the assembly, in the church, and beyond, to model what thanksgiving to God looks like. Because the new generation learns, picks up, socializes into a culture of gratitude before the living God. Do you see? David understands that too. Here is public proclamation. Now the president kindly mentioned that I began yesterday with the first of the Henry lectures on this series. And at that time I told one story I won't repeat the lecture. You are blessed. But there is one story I told then that I will tell now, since relatively few of you were at the lecture yesterday. For those of you who were there, you get to hear the story twice. A number of years ago here um, at Trinity, there was a, a student, a doctoral student. We'll call him George. He had been sent by his mission to Bolivia as a missionary. He was about six foot four, skinny as a beanpole, went down there single, learned the language well, eventually met a single missionary down there, and they were married. At the time this story begins, the little girl was about three and a half. The mission decided to send him back to Trinity to do a PhD in New Testament um, in order to better prepare Bolivian pastors and up the level of training down there. So he came up here and started his PhD. Six months into it, his wife was diagnosed with stage four breast cancer. He withdrew from the program. He had family in the Twin Cities and elsewhere. The church helped him. The seminary helped him. The mission helped him. He received a lot of support. She went through chemo, double mastectomy, uh, a miserable year. But at the end of it, he came back and continued with his PhD. 
Six months later, he was diagnosed with advanced stomach cancer. Although there are a lot of good cancer hospitals in the metro Chicago area, none of them would touch it. They recommended hospice care. The mission sent them up to Mayo. They said, we're not going to guarantee anything, but there is some experimental stuff that we could do. They took out 90% of his stomach, started him on drugs that were really designed for um, uh, abdominal cancer. After about six or eight months, he lost a lot of weight. He had to eat every three or four hours because he only had one-tenth of his stomach. But he came back and continued on his program. Another six months passed, and his wife's cancer came back, and she died. Some time passed, and he came back again, finished his Ph.D., And before he returned to his beloved Bolivia with his then nine-and-a-half-year-old daughter, he spoke in our church, and his 40 minutes were taken up with exposition of Scripture that did nothing more than thank God for his goodness and grace. He was giving testimony in the public assembly for all the kindness has shown him, for the love displayed by his parents, by the divinity school, by the medical staff, above all for the forgiveness of sins, for the assurance of life, for real hope, he would see his wife again. And the Lord had spared him still to serve and to father his daughter. He spent his whole time in gratitude. And I want to tell you, that is simply normal Christian living. Anything less is subnormal. Now that's the first half of the psalm. The second half of the psalm I can deal with much more quickly. Verse 11 is transitional. One of the remarkable things about the psalm is how, despite the fact that verses 1 to 10 are all given over to joyful praise to the God who helps, verses 11 to 17, the second division of the psalm, finds us back with trouble. We might call it renewed anticipation of the God who helps. Trouble is still around. This does not mean that verses 1 to 10 are faked. Rather, God recognizes that in this broken world, real and wonderful deliverance, glorious it may be, as it may be, is not final. Just because you've had a miserable divorce doesn't mean you'll escape cancer. Just because you've had a bankruptcy doesn't mean you won't get in a traffic accident. Just because you've had cancer doesn't mean you'll be spared Alzheimer's. Well, this is cheerful, isn't it? But that's exactly what David is doing here. He he has been released. He has been saved. But he knows he's going to need more help. Do do, do you see? It's it's not a a one-shot deal and then everything's hunky-dory and you go off in the sunset singing happy cowboy songs as as the scrolls uh, with a credit goes up the screen against the background of a glorious sunset. No. Now we learn something of the sweep of God's help, the different kinds of things where God will help us in troubles that David himself anticipates in the future. Do not withhold your mercy from me, Lord. May your love and faithfulness always protect me. This is an ongoing need. First, God helps in the arena of personal sin, verse 12. For troubles without number surround me. My sins have overtaken me, and I cannot see. They are more than the hairs of my head, and my heart fails within me. Now, we don't know exactly what that first miserable, slimy pit was, that miry bog. We just don't know. And it's probably a good thing we don't know. 
Because then we can apply the metaphor to other kinds of trouble. Just as it's probably a good thing, we can't be quite sure what the thorn in the flesh was that Paul faced either. Because we can apply it to other kinds of things that, uh, that uh, are not specified. But it's interesting that the pit language returns here. My, my sins have overtaken me and, and I, I, I cannot see. It's almost as if he's sinking down and he can't even get his head up to see over them. Uh, of course, what David faced may have been betrayal by his family. It may have been illness. It may have been political problems. Who knows? But it may have been his own sin. It certainly is in verse 12. In the miry bog of shame and guilt, a covenant believer, a leader amongst the people of God, And my sins have overtaken me, and I cannot see they're more than the hairs of my head. My heart fails within me. To whom then will you go? God helps in the arena of personal sin. Then second, God helps in the arena of bitter enemies, verses 13 to 15. They do not have the right to take advantage of David's fall. So although his own sin discourages him, the smug attacks of his enemies arouse in him a sense of injustice He wants God to take action to help him. As in times of conflict over moral issues and even of war and brutality, sometimes one's prayer is not, God forgive them, but stop them. So also here, be pleased to save me, Lord. Come quickly, Lord, to help me. May all who want to take my life be put to shame and confusion. May all who desire my ruin be turned back to disgrace. May those who say to me, aha, aha, be appalled at their own shame. For we serve a God who is not only plentiful in mercy, but is passionate about justice. That is why ultimately our only ultimate hope is in the cross. And then, God helps in the arena of personal sin. God helps in the arena of bitter enemies. God helps all those who seek him, all that is, who seek God's glory, verse 16. But may all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who long for your saving help always say, the Lord is great. To compare what I am with what you are is actually a very steadying sort of thing. To pray for God's glory is not a form of enslavement, but a step in liberation, the way of victory. May all who seek your glory, may they coalesce around this prayer, this confession. Yigdal Yahweh. Now all of you know some Hebrew. Variously rendered, may the Lord be exalted. The Lord is great. Write it on a card and put it on your refrigerator door. Yigdal Yahweh. Put it on the mirror in your washroom. Let that be your confession, your cry, your common praise, your God-centeredness. God helps all those who seek him, that is, who seek God's glory. And finally, God helps even me. It's remarkable after such a psalm of high thoughts and soaring vistas that David ends, but as for me, I am poor and needy. May the Lord think of me. You are my help and my deliverer. You are my God. Do not delay. Let us pray. And so, in truth, Lord God, we utter our confession. We have not loved you as we ought. We have not served you as we ought. In our best moments, we so often become full of pride. And it is never too long until there are also shameful moments. 
O Lord, have mercy. Help us in our relationships. Help us in our crises. Help us with the grace of perseverance. Help us so that our instantaneous response is to devote ourselves to you the way the ultimate servant of God opened his ears to listen to your holy will. Grant, Lord God, that we will be quick to give praise in the public assembly in a God-focused, Christ-honoring fashion that constantly deflects self-promotion. O Lord God, meet us in all of our needs, in our sin and our guilt, and grant that in every area of life, our lips will be quick to say, may the Lord be exalted. The Lord is great. Yigdal Yahweh. We ask for Jesus' glory and the good of his blood-bought people. Amen.